This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 363 of the Yellow Wall Pod. I'm your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about the Derby Sieg. Wir sind Derby Sieger because Schalke are getting relegated and that's exactly what we are going to talk about Matthias. I feel like this episode is going to be like five minutes long plus uh, the uh, also important Bielefeld preview obviously but Derby Sieger Matthias Zug is here with me. Hello Matthias, how are you doing this week? I hope you had a good weekend. What happened? You know, Derby Sieger Stefan, I'm doing well. I hope you're doing well, Derby Sieger Stefan. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing very well. Ah, fantastic. For nothing. And it's not just and it's not just a Derby Sieg. It was a Derby demolition. It was a demolition derby. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> yeah, I am a dad and I do say dad jokes. Um, no, it was pretty I mean, the Sevilla match was already, you know, great. Um, because that, nobody expected that. And then the Derby on top, uh, and, and listening to all the podcasts everywhere, everybody's saying about <laughs> Dortmund's back. Give me and, all the content. <laughs> I yeah, need you guys to talk about Dortmund exactly. and how good they are and how amazing exactly. and how shitty Shaka are. Yeah, exactly. That's, and it, that's what we're all great. craving. It's great. And, you know, for me, I went through, I don't know how it was for you, Stefan, but emotionally, I changed during that match because... <laughs> When I heard Shkodra Mustafi got injured, I'm like, okay, so now Ochipka's in the back line. And then Ralf Fehrmann broke a rib, or kind of broke a rib, and he's out. And they had to sub him. That's 14. 14 players are out injured for Schalke now. 14. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. Is this the squad that uh, will have to leave when they get relegated? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much. But... I was like, I was starting to feel bad for them. I was like, oh man, that's eh, whew, that's not a that's feeling I had. <laughs> yeah, and and then they started to just basically try to kick the shit out of Moray every single chance they had. And I am critical of Moray. I think I am justified in my criticism. But seeing that poor kid <laughs> get the absolute crap kicked out of him. And the funny thing is, then when Thomas Meunier came in, who is like a head taller and probably 20 kilos heavier, nobody tried to try tried to kick the crap out of him. And that's what I'm like, you know what, Schalke, screw you, you dirtbag pieces of shit. <laughs> I look forward to watching you struggle against Sandhausen, Regensburg, Aue, and Heidenheim next season. Yeah, maybe even Grotterfurt or... What else? What else do we have? Well, Greuterfurt well, Greuter has a chance of getting promoted, so I'm not going to quite. <laughs> I'm not going to quite. You know, there's a better chance Greuterfurt's going to play in the Bundesliga, first Bundesliga than um, Schalke. Then Schalke is going to be playing <laughs> in the first Bundesliga next season. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, uh, we do have a sponsor for this episode. I almost forgot to say. We are complete schuldenfrei. We zahlen keinen einzigen Euro an Zinsen. And uh, our episode sponsor is Dave Kensler and. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah so basically what i do is when you sponsor an episode and sometimes i do miss it because patreon is weird and sometimes i don't get the email and why not but uh, i asked him if he wants to give a shout out or a nice message and he got nothing and what he did is he put dortmund into a slogan generator and i should pick one but that's not fun uh so matthias uh that's that's a very hard turn now from uh, the derby talk, but uh, you need to pick the slogan, and I'm going to read the slogans for you. Dortmund asks for nothing in return. Dortmund, okay. forget the rest. Connecting the world. <laughs> Can you tell Dortmund from butter? <laughs> Me and my Dortmund. Long live Dortmund. Moving at the speed of Dortmund. Fine and delicious story. The only shoe on the earth. <laughs> Dortmund know-how. Okay. Unbeatable. How cool it is. The ultimate casino here. See the world with Dortmund. <laughs> is... I would say probably the best one there is moving at the speed of Dortmund. 
simply because of counterattacking speed. Um, that that's the only one where I'm like, okay, the butter one is a little weird. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, I I don't get that, but I'm old. <clears throat> I have so no idea what what that means, honestly. I don't know. It's but, it's but just moving, internet gibberish. M- moving at the speed of Dortmund. That's that was actually. That was actually kind of nice. You know, I mean, like the positive, you move at the speed of Dortmund or negative, you move at the speed of Schalke. You know, Schalke, who have pretty much been last since the first match day. Well, I don't know what um, you mean. Schalke are moving very fast to what? No. Towards the Bundesliga. <laughs> okay. But they're not moving from their spot. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so let's go with moving at the speed of Dortmund. I'll go with that one. All right. All right, because so, I can't remember any of the other ones. <laughs> so, anywho, thank you uh, very much, Dave, for uh, this uh, sponsorship. And obviously, uh, if anyone else out there uh, wants to sponsor an episode, go to patreoncom slash wall and ideally uh, write us a message right away. Because, like I said before, Patreon is weird, and sometimes I don't get an email. All right. So, uh, with all that, Matthias. Uh, Shall we talk about the game? Because uh, Borussia Dortmund did have a similar lineup uh, to the one against Sevilla, but uh, Thomas Delaney was back in there. Uh, I'm very glad to report that Mahmoud Tahut uh, survived the cut, and obviously uh, Emre Can also stayed in, but Manuel Akanji had to go out because he has a hamstring issue, uh, injury, so he'll maybe miss a week or two or three. I don't know how long it'll take. Um, any other... Oh yeah, Julian Brandt somehow rotated back into the team. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the reason for that was, but uh, yeah. Other, otherwise, a good lineup, uh, I would say, or not even otherwise, in, in general a good lineup, because I was very happy with um, the Dahoud and Delaney pairing, because I thought that was... Uh, Sort of the key. We always know. We we all know that Delaney always has a good Revier derby. That's sort of his specialty. And uh, Dahoud showed against Sevilla that he has necessary uh, aggression, especially in the uh, uh, you know counter pressing, which uh, Dortmund very much needed in this game. And I think uh, it it paid off uh, several times. So Matthias, that all being said, um, uh, the uh, the first half was a very dominant one, but uh, I don't really feel like Dortmund created two chances r- right away. Uh, how did you see at the uh, beginning of the game until Dortmund finally broke the deadlock? I mean, it was kind of to be expected to a degree. I mean, Schalke focused very much on trying to be defensively solid, which for the most part they achieved. They did a decent amount of low block, block pressing, uh, I, I know Christian Gross was very unhappy about how deep Schalke were because obviously there was just nothing. I mean, you had Matthew Hoppy up top and he was deep. I mean, there's just nothing you could do with that except hoping for silly set pieces, uh, which a couple of were given away. I will admit that. But overall, uh, they j- there was just nothing there. It was more about let's just not lose versus let's try to do anything really and that frustrated Dortmund ish it it didn't frustrate them in the sense that Dortmund gave up I mean they were still pacey they still moved it was just it was difficult it was difficult to get through all of those players but then slowly but surely it started to come together and the openings were there and it was I never was worried that you know, I wasn't concerned Dortmund wouldn't score. I mean, I'm always concerned that the other team's going to get lucky with a set piece because that's just the Achilles heel right now. Let's face it. That is the big issue. Um, but beyond that, I wasn't concerned because Schalke weren't doing anything from open play. And Dortmund, I just felt like they were confident enough that they were going to get this done. There was a swagger about the team. There was a confidence about the team. There was never any panic. There were never any dropped heads. So while it took a while, I was very confident that it would happen. Now, I thought it would maybe happen in the second half because as we got to like the 40th minute, I'm like, "Eh, I don't know if they're going to score now before the half, which then they obviously did. Also, thanks to Schalke just being really, really bad at the footballs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... uh... Ultimately, Stambouli who lost the ball uh, to Matteo Morey, you know, after you... 
uh, said that he needs to be uh, sold and should never play again for Dortmund. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say he should never play or again. Or loaned out or something like that. He should like be that. loaned out. He's just not ready. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, he, he stuck out a lucky boot in that situation, but there were plenty of situations also where defensively his positioning is just in his own third. Is It, it makes me nervous, Stefan. It's, it really, really makes me nervous. And it's telling that Schalke again and again and again, tried to attack across that side because they knew that was the weakness. Yeah. Everybody knows that's the yeah, weakness. Yeah, there was a graphic that pretty much almost all of the shark attacks went over their own left side. I, I think that's also down to the fact that uh, their only semi-capable players, yeah, Kolasinac, is playing on that wing slash side. Fine. So maybe, Fine. maybe yeah. that's also down to that. It's not just Moray. It's just that Schalke don't have anyone good. <laughs> Except yeah, but, Kolasinac, but it's good for was... But it's good for him that he did that. I mean, that's confidence. When you're a young guy, you need that confidence. I still have my... Moray's very talented, but I have my massive questions. I mean, he can't cross to save his life. Um, and defensive, his positioning is is suspect. And physically, he's not very strong. Those are, those are kind of issues when you're a fullback. I'll be honest. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> those, those make me a little nervous at times. But uh, it was the right kind of opponent for him to to work out those things. But, uh, you know, and, and obviously him being in the right position in that moment in the attacking third, being able to get the boot in, turning over the ball. But then, of course, the rest is Jaden Sancho, really. Yeah, who had a really good game. Um, and I think we need to single him out a little bit. Uh, but yeah, a f- fantastic strike. Um, I was a little surprised that he went to the uh, near corner, Uh but uh, yeah, Michael Langer without a chance there, really. It was a, just a well-struck ball. Um, and then, of course, three minutes later, uh, maybe one of the goals of the season. I don't know. Uh, but uh, also probably down to uh, Schalke having to defend with uh, Ochipka, who is not a centre-back, but uh, it was a very uh, well-weighed uh, cross into the box by Sancho. And uh, yeah, that uh, I think in... In German, you call it Seidfeldseher. In English, you would probably call it scissor kick or something like that, or a half volley. Or yeah, it's not a half volley. It's it's a volley. Um, yeah, uh, tremendous goal, uh, pure world class. I don't know what else to say, Matthias. If you have any more words, superlatives, etc., to add, be my guest. He's a machine. Holland is a machine. He's a beast, and he's twenty. That's scary as shit, man. <laughs> when you think about. You know, Lewandowski reaching really his peak echelon in his late 20s and 30. How much better can this guy get? I just hope and pray that he can stay healthy because he's a big frame guy. And sometimes that can be a difficulty long term because of punishment you just take. Um, but it's there's nothing left to say. But, you know, you, with Holland, you're, it's like you're shocked when he doesn't score. Even when he takes pot shots from way out, you're like, how did that not go in? It's Holland. So for him to score like that was just absolutely amazing. And like you said, signaling out Jaden Sancho, who was rightfully much maligned for the first half of the season, when we, a lot of us, including myself, were like, maybe Dolman should have cashed in in the summer. He's now back to his world-class best. I mean, he is a difference maker. But for me, Holland and Sancho were great. But they were not the best Dortmund players on the pitch, in my opinion. No, that's true. But uh, while we're on the sub- central subject, I would officially, with this game, crown him as a true Borussia. I'm honest because... Uh, well, yeah. I mean, the the hitting, the, the emblem on the chest, I don't even remember really ever seeing him do that, if I'm honest. I don't yeah, remember just, him... Just like, the entire body language. He just could, yeah. could see he was all into this game. He knows now, I think it was his sixth derby, also, uh, like seven in total, but he only played in six the year four four derby, uh, the infamous one. He, uh, I think he he was not fit for that. But um, yeah, you could you could totally see that he has understood what this game means for this club, and uh, he played accordingly, which uh, is super nice to see. Especially um, you know that that run in the ninetieth minute or so where he was just still running and sprinting forward and, and working very hard to run up the score. Um, and obviously, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, just the, the sheer joy he had. And I think it's notable that he uh, finished the game with the captain's armband. When Marco Reus was subbed off, he kept it. 
Um, that's an interesting development. So um, I, I think this is probably Sancho's last and final season at Dortmund. You know, most likely, who knows what happens. But uh, nevertheless, I think that's a positive development. It's just nice to see. You know, for for a Dortmund fan, you you know he'll not hang around forever, but at least um, you know have some identification and growing together with the club in the meantime is is still nice, still warms your heart. So um, I'm I'm very happy about this development, and uh, you know, we have criticized Jane Sancho a lot. Other people have criticized him him even more for seeming abject and not caring about uh you know football or, or Dortmund because uh, he has been sanctioned by the club for a couple of mishaps but uh, I think uh, he is growing up and uh, becoming more of a leader in the team taking over more responsibility and um, yeah good partnership obviously with Haaland but uh, he obviously makes it easy for you to grab assists just think about that hang time it's just incredible <laughs> it's like an Ibrahimovic goal um, but yeah, uh, that's all I all I have to say about Jane Sancho. But I I do agree he was not the best player uh, of of the uh, team. Who, in your opinion, was though, Matthias? Mo Dahoud. I think Mo Dahoud over the last two matches is the best Borussia Dortmund player. That's my personal opinion, and it it brings me so much joy to have that opinion, given that obviously I've been extremely critical of him, justifiably so. He is playing now to the level that I believed and hoped he would be capable of doing but didn't really show before. And now, I mean, in my opinion, you cannot break up Dahoud and Delaney. Um, you can maybe give them a rest with Bellingham or you can play with that magical three midfield, which obviously only geniuses think of. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I was so sad that you couldn't make it last week due to, I know, uh, what I was know. it, Eltern Sprechtag? Crazy. Uh, it was insane. We had a snow day. My wife came down with a, a stomach bug, and we had virtual parent-teacher conferences and a grocery delivery. It mm. was – yeah, I was not I, – I needed a drink that night. Um, <laughs> but uh, Dahoot, in my opinion, and you may disagree, was the best player. He dictated that game. He ran the game. Um, he – you know, the Hollywood passes where you're like, ah – aren't really there also in his own third, you know, something that Julian Brandt does a lot, way too often. Um, Dahoud is more uh, precise with his passing. He's more, his decision-making is good. His body turns. Like he'll get the ball in his own third, be under pressure and turn in a way that completely opens everything up for him and unlocks a defense that's pressing him high that I haven't seen a Dortmund midfielder do since Ilkay Gundogan. I'll be honest. That 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 those just those little movements, those little turns, that quickness of feet with the ball. Um, I don't. I mean, I'll personally don't. I would rather have Dahoud play than Axel Witzel in that position because he's a more progressive passer. Uh, definitely more than Brandt because he's better against pressing and he's more intelligent with the ball, especially in his own third. You couple that with Delaney or Bellingham next to him, uh, then I think you have that ma magic two or three man midfield. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I actually, you know, I really like the three midfield, especially with uh, Delaney and Bellingham, because you, you have that, uh, you know, <laughs> the, 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 hot, the hot sauce, if you will. You have a little bit of aggressiveness and I think for Dortmund... Uh, in this situation, at least, you know, we can always talk about the macro development of a club. Um, but I think uh, for the current situation, it's more important for Dortmund to have a little bit more compactness in midfield and uh, uh, a way to force turnovers because I don't see Dortmund creating too much out of play just by themselves. They can obviously do that. Um, but I think uh, having a good counter press and uh, a sturdy midfield that allows you to do that um, is more important. And so a 4-3-3 system right now is something I, I really like, even though it was probably more 4-2-3-1 again. Um, but nevertheless, um, yeah, I, th I think Dahoud, uh, to, to add to your point, um, really plays the ball forward quickly once he gains possession. And I think that is the absolute key that the ball does not 
sit at his feet for half a second while he's thinking about his next move. It's fluid and it's quick. And that is uh, what Dortmund really do need because when they win the ball or when they move the ball, the opponent is not completely organized. And I think Dortmund have done that way too often that they have uh, just delayed the game and allowed their opponent to get back into formation. And now with the hood, you have a player um, who passes the ball around, but more importantly, passes it quickly forward and into the half spaces. You know, he finds his teammates in dangerous positions and he he has a precision right now to find a Haaland or to find a Reus or so, or even a Sancho uh, in, in those positions where, where really trouble will ensue. And uh, I think this is a big difference uh, that Dortmund not only uh, managed to progress the ball quickly, but progress them into dangerous zones to dangerous players. And uh, that makes uh, yeah Dortmund beat Schalke uh, for nothing and I mean if you look at the expected goals I think Dortmund only had 1.7 or so it wasn't even that high Dortmund were just super clinical in this game which is nice to see why Schalke I think uh, were more aiming for Dortmund players than uh, for the goal because uh, there were seven blocked shots on the Schalke side which is kind of uh, interesting but also speaks to the fact that Dortmund were really out for it and threw themselves into the shots now obviously we had that one Marvin hit safe uh, I don't even know who shot it was, whether it was Harit or uh, somebody else. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that was maybe the one dicey moment of the entire game, if you ask me. Um, no, it was it was Suat Seda who, who took that shot. Um, that was the only moment where the game could have maybe tilted into a different direction. But uh, otherwise, uh, I think uh, there wasn't really much chaos. Oh yeah, that one Hummels chance where or not Hummel's chance, rather, where he tried to stop the ball and just slip through his legs or something weird. That also could have been more dangerous, but Chaka are just not good enough to punish Dortmund for, for such a mistake. I'm pretty sure uh, 50% of the Bundesliga would have uh, capitalized there. But, um, Matthias, um, let's progress a little bit uh, on the timeline, because in Tessic, uh, obviously, was asked about that... Uh, Haaland goal, but then he quickly said that uh, his favorite goal of the day was the 3 0. Why is that, Matthias? Because it's one of the most beautifully crafted team goals you'll ever see. I mean, it was an absolute complete move from start to finish that tore through Schalke like a hot knife through Dortmund butter. No, <laughs> there's the butter reference, but <laughs> through butter. It just, it was. It was fantastic to watch. I mean, yes, the sensational goal was Holland, the first one, uh, the the 2-0. Obviously, sensational, world-class, no no question. But and, and it gets you, ooh. But that goal, that third goal, is the type of goal that I love because it's so smooth and so dynamic. It's not up to a single moment of individual world-class brilliance but down to the entire team coming together and just destroying the opposition. And that's what I like to see because that's something you build upon moving forward. Individual world class is great, but you can't count on it time and time again. But if you build the confidence to carve teams up like that, then you can replicate that over and over again. And then the individual moments of brilliance just happen. Yeah, what's also so great about that goal is uh, around the 60th minute, it, it just decided the game. I think it ended the competition right there. Um, the little drips of hope that Schalke maybe had left, they were then completely eviscerated, and I think that sort of sealed the Schalke relegation. And I think, I don't know about you, but I think we can really say that this game sealed Schalke's relegation. If you now go to 538, I think the probability of Schalke going down is 98%. And... Uh, I think I think it's done. It's over. And uh, when Dortmund won a title race a couple of years ago, and they lost four two two against Schalke, all the Schalke fans claimed that uh, they sort of ruined Dortmund's championship. Well, guess what? Now we are relegating you. You are going down for a very long time, at least one and a half years, without a Revier Derby. Um, this is why I called the last episode the last Revier Derby because it's that certain now that Schalke are going away and I don't know for how long so um, it's just a, a beautiful goal to do it like that especially with that Marco Royce assist 
Uh, <laughs> and I must say, I'm, uh, I was surprised that Marco Reus, of all people, was uh, onside in this situation. Um, but yeah, uh, really, really nice goal. And I, I think the uh, the fourth goal, the Dortmund goal, was uh, also very nice. Uh, nice pass from Sancho to Bellingham, and uh, he crosses it right between uh, Lange and uh, I think who was it a Chipka? I don't know. Anyway, it was obviously Haaland there to just poke it home. Uh, something I arguably could have sto- scored as well. But uh, yeah, well crafted goal uh, and uh, totally deserved. I don't think uh, the scoreline, you, you can't really complain about it uh, if you're the Schalke coach or anyone else because I, I think Dortmund just completely dominated Schalke from start to finish. I mean, after halftime, there were like 10, 15 minutes or so where Schalke got a little bit better uh, and Dortmund were a bit more disorganized, but it's not like they uh, created a high volume of chances in this game. Um, so yeah, Matthias, for last derby, I think uh, this is a very nice one. And uh, you could really see this uh, game giving everyone a big lift in black and yellow. Oh, I agree. And, you know, the referencing when Schalke fans were so gleeful about spoiling the party for Dortmund, I think they tend to forget the fact that Dortmund literally spoiled uh, um, a title party for Schalke in Revier Derby a few years before that. 2007. And... Yeah, and I would rather not win the title in the Rivier Derby than get relegated in the Rivier Derby because Dortmund's going to be playing in the Bundesliga, and Schalke. No. I I almost I thought about tweeting it uh, saying, "Wow, won't it be amazing when Kaiserslautern play against Schalke in the Dritte Liga in two years?" But that would be assuming that Kaiserslautern don't get relegated. Um, <laughs> out of the Dritte Liga. But no, I mean, I agree with you. This this was that death nail. I think Schalke, you know, Dortmund have really been hurt by the lack of fans in the stadium. I don't think Schalke were... I think Schalke benefited from the fact that there weren't fans in the stadium that day because that, that wouldn't have ended well. I when- think that, you know, that match where people went on the pitch and took the arm the captain's armband from Stambouli I th- that that was nothing compared to what would have happened after this match I mean there were uh, some Schalke ultras who uh, tried to get access to the team um not quite like storming storming <laughs> not quite like storming the capital <laughs> in the United States but uh, um yeah uh, I don't think uh, Schalke fans are too happy right now but that being said um we do have to Realize that in the uh, quote unquote Corona derbies, Dortmund have a goal difference of 11 to 0. So, um, I mean, you could argue that uh, the absence of fans helps Dortmund more than Schalke because Dortmund are obviously the favorite and uh, yeah. the lack of I mean, atmosphere overall. relegates this a little bit more to a friendly. If you will, I mean, it's it's not a friendly, obviously, but you you, you just know it's it's different with fans in there. But that being said, uh, Schalke also have been complete ass. So it's really hard to to say whether or not fans would have helped or not. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I meant more with Dortmund in general. Just, you know, their home form hasn't been great. And and that huge support can definitely make a difference. And what what nails Schalke down, what, what really puts the nail in their coffin, isn't just losing this isn't just losing it the way they did, but Mainz beat Gladbach. So, <laughs> you know, they, they may not even catch 17th. Yeah, Bielefeld still needs to play against Bremen, which that's a toss-up at this point because Bremen are not good right now. Um, so it, it just, uh, Schalke, there's no hope. I mean, there's, I don't see any hope whatsoever because the teams around them, Bielefeld and Mainz, uh, are still picking up points. So are Hertha. When Schalke, so are even Hertha <laughs> to pick up a point, even though they're uh, looking like they may, if they're not careful, Hertha may be playing in the second Bundesliga as well. Um, but, they, you know, Schalke, there's just nothing. They're, unless they play against Hoffenheim, which I still don't know how Hoffenheim lost that match the way they did, uh, which is the only match in 37 matches that Schalke has won. Imagine. And or thirty eight. What now a it's number. What a number. That's insane. That's that's an imagine you're going an entire Premier League season 
winning once. That's what that is. 38 matches. <laughs> yeah, one That's, four nothing win though. <laughs> that that yeah, uh, granted. Yeah, but still, I mean, that is so pitifully crap that the only thing that's making Schalke somewhat happy is the three-point rule um, because of the three points from that win. But other than that, ouch, just ouch. Yeah, it's absolutely devastating. I mean, being a Schalke fan these days must be absolutely cruel. You know, you have the uh, pandemic going on. You live in the ugliest city of Germany by far. Just terrible place to be. And then your local soccer team, the only thing you really have left, just crumbles in front of your very eyes. And it's just not the thing on the pitch, it's off the pitch too. It's the blood money you take from Russia. And the swine prince, <laughs> Clemens Tonius, thinking he can run this club by himself and runs it into the ground over like a decade. And the amount of sporting directors that are coming in and going out... Jochen Schneider is leaving now at the end of the season because he is maybe in over his head or he just doesn't like it there anymore because it smells funny. Who knows? But Matthias, this is like... Shambles is, is like too nicely put. This is like a, a complete shithole exploded. You know, this is Gelsen, Gelsenkirchen right now. There's not one positive, run, one redeeming feature and Schalke and Wolfier are going down and they are burning really hard. So I don't know how they're going to even recover from this. And, you know, well, I've, yeah. been, I've been listening to podcasts too and people are always pointing out, oh, well, this team, you know, in theory on paper, they could be better than they are, but they're not. <laughs> no, and I mean, the 14, 14 injuries definitely makes things worse, but you have to ask why. Why are there that many injuries? What's the problem? Because that's, and you bring in what, what just I find so ridiculously stupid, Klaas Jan Huntela. That is like the ultimate dumbass move ever. But what do you think he's going to do? Especially when you look at in 90 minutes, your two strikers you've had on the pitch got one shot. In 90 minutes, one shot, two guys. That Klaas Jan Huntela at 275 years old is not going to make the difference, especially since he's been injured the entire time. And that just speaks to that. I want, who would have thought, Stefan, that the ultimate peak of Schalke was Horst Held as sporting director? <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, everybody trashed him when he left. He was the best they've had. In 15 years, undoubtedly. And so, I mean, ever since Rudi Asawa basically stepped away, it's been a complete bottomless pit of shit. They had one blip season, <laughs> one blip season, where the entire Bundesliga decided to just crap themselves. And Schalke were like, hey, we scored 27 set-piece goals <laughs> from, like, 35 goals. I don't quote me on those stats, but it's pretty close. Yeah, yeah. The, um, also, not only was yeah. it, who do you call it the sport, Horst Held? You know, yeah. Jens Keller was the, the last really yes. good coach. You know, yes. Tedesco, yeah, he was there, had not this blip season. But Jens Keller, like on average, I think, points-wise, was the best last coach Schalke had. Jens Keller! Come on. <laughs> and Jens Keller, I mean, he was... So, like, the Schalke fans eviscerated him any chance they could had they only known he was the best one to have, you know, uh, for the next, I don't even know how many years it's been. It, this season must seem like 100 years for Schalke fans, and that's fine. 100 years of misery isn't enough. <laughs> um, because I still remember when Mukoko was playing in the under-23s and under-19s against Schalke and how those dirtbag racist fans treated him. So you deserve this shit, Schalke. You absolutely deserve this. Also from the blowhard, the Großkotzing, um, <laughs> which is such a German term, I know. You know <laughs> giant vomiting is, is the literal translation about, oh, we're going to surpass Dortmund. 
you know, yeah, you may surpass Dortmund's second team on the way down to the Regionalliga West if you keep up with this. Because, uh, like you said, next season, Schalke playing in the Zweite Bundesliga. Sponsors go away. Gazprom is going to drop them like a hot potato because why would you want to be associated with this anymore? Then you throw in the top of the fact that debt, 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 debt. And the debt's only going to get worse because, you know, players you can't sell, you're either going to have to pay them or pay them off to get out from underneath those contracts. Others aren't going to come because, like you said, Gelsenkirchen with Duisburg is probably the ugliest city in Germany. Um, and so it, it's, I just, it's that spiral that Kaiserslautern went down, that other bigger clubs in that region, Essen, Oberhausen, um, then you go to other areas, former Bundesliga teams like Kickers Offenbach, they all went down that spiral that Schalke can go down. Stuttgart didn't go down that way, but they had a completely different foundation. They didn't have the debt. Hamburg are lucky that they haven't gone down that spiral, but man, they were close. And if they don't get promoted this season, maybe the same thing. Hertha didn't go down that spiral also because of other, because it's Berlin. You know, Hamburg and Berlin, those are cities you want to live in. Gelsenkirchen is a city you don't want to send anybody to walk through. <laughs> so it's just, I, I see. It's, I mean, it's, obviously it's no, Germany's last open air gulag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. That's, that's, that's like, damn. Um, ouch, you know, I was going to say it's like Cleveland, um, but Same even thing. Cleveland wins titles, but even Cleveland wins titles, man, even Cleveland wins titles. Yeah, well, LeBron's not going to come together. <laughs> I, I don't see LeBron James suiting up for Schalke. Um, and there's no hope because yes, they have got a great youth, youth system, Had. but everybody keeps going away. And now if you're a youth from the region, unless you're so emotionally tied to Schalke as a club, um, you're probably going to go to Dortmund. Yeah, there's no one honestly, emotionally tied to this club anymore. The yeah, only thing you're going to no. be is emotionally repelled after this. I mean, come on. It's terrible. Just, just yeah. god awful. And, and, it's, and, and it's, you know, on the one hand, it's a joy to behold. But the spectacle of the Revier Derby leaving the Bundesliga is actually a bad thing. It is. Um, if you look at it from a football cultural aspect because you do have all these plastic clubs these non-tradition clubs becoming stronger and stronger or staying in the league where you lose something that's so special away that's why hopefully Hamburg come back because at least you'll have the not Dabby again and it, it just it loses that something special but that aside I'm okay with Schalke being relegated because most of my childhood in the 1980s, Schalke were in the Zweite Bundesliga. I, as a kid, it was like Schalke are a second Bundesliga team. And it would be nice if my children can say the same thing. <laughs> well, you know, it, when we talk about the uh, the emotion that a derby win can cause and the benefit it has for Borussia Dortmund if they and when they beat Schalke, how it can galvanize the team. Just think back to the first title-winning season under Jurgen Klopp, when Shinji Kagawa was carried on the shoulders of Dortmund fans when they returned. You know, these are things that live forever. And, uh, you know, Dortmund had a lot of great derby wins where they, um, yeah, really uh, managed to to go from there and, and, and build something. I, I think still the, the one in 2010, I think it was, the 3-1 win, uh, where Felix Magat was the coach and announced a four-year plan in which uh, Schalke within that time frame should win the championship and with that four-year plan Dortmund won it twice. <laughs> Never gets old to me. Um, yeah, that was sort of that was sort of the kickstart for that season that they knew something special could happen there when Kagawa said beforehand, I'm going to score twice and then he did. Uh, just uh, h hilarious. Um, but... You know, we, we had something similar this uh, time around. And I think for the first time in the whole year, um, you had fans actively celebrating with uh, with uh, the team, except for that one game against Gladbach, I think, where like 20,000 or so were allowed in the stadium. But this was obviously different uh, when Dortmund's team bus returned to the 
Trainingscenter in Brakel, the Hohenbusch, Adi, Adi Preisler Allee. Um, there, there were, uh, you know, fans with uh, pyrotechnics and, yeah, just uh, a big throng of people celebrating. Obviously, uh, you have to... Uh, <laughs> I almost said it leaves a bitter taste in your mouth during a pandemic, but we all know that COVID does not leave a taste in your mouth at all. That's the problem. Um, and Dortmund have been fined for violating the uh, regulations of the DFL. I think they are paying a ne negligible amount of 75,000 euros. Um, but yeah, it's it's more of a symbolic fine. But nevertheless, um, I, you know, on, on the one hand, I see all these people not wearing masks, being close together, and I'm cringing very hard. But on the other hand, you're just very happy to see something like that. Matthias, uh, I, I assume you are also sort of uh, in two minds there looking at these pictures. And obviously there's this one great picture uh, from outside where you see Haaland and, and Paslak and whatnot, all with the super big eyes looking at the, the fans celebrating this, this win. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously with the, the COVID regulations, all that kind of stuff, that was, um, from that standpoint, not not a smart move, not a good play, but it was, it was great in a, in a 12 month period, um, that has been plagued by, and no pun intended, plagued by <laughs> bad plague. news. Okay. Um, it was great to see people with that much joy and passion, and happiness, and knowing that Borussia Dortmund, that these players and this team can do it. So yes, obviously, COVID protocol, don't do it, not smart, don't endorse it at all. Um, and the 75,000 euro fine, fine, whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, that, I think that just dropped out of Holland's back pocket. <laughs> but the... What that does in a in a 12-month period where, yes, there were occasionally where there were fans in the stadium, but overall, these teams have been so um, starved of fan interaction and emotion and really living the emotion. Not emotion through social media. Fuck that shit. I'm talking about legit seeing how much this club, this team, team this ma this match means to the people i think it's huge absolutely huge and can is something they will remember and carry forward for the rest of the season i truly truly believe that i truly believe that started with sevilla and is now carried through in this match and i believe it will continue because obviously the next match is against bielefeld which is an absolutely winnable game so i i think from that aspect it, it was it was great while obviously not being great at all if <laughs> if i'm making any sense with that yeah you you are i mean it's just the uh the the world we live in right now that uh you you want to be purely happy about it but you can't so um with that being said i think you need to leave soon so i think we should slightly turn our attention to the uh, game against Arminia Bielefeld, um, who obviously right now are in 16th place. Uh, they have 18 points, um, and I think they have five wins, so that's four more than Schalke. <laughs> um, their last match was against Wolfsburg, who obviously are six points ahead of Dortmund, and there was a very clean 3 nothing loss where Wolfsburg completely dominated that game. I think it was a Friday game. Um, their coach is obviously Uwe Neuhaus, who was doing a very good job. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, uh, Arminia Bielefeld came up into the Bundesliga and it was sort of clear that this is a game where Dortmund usually would stumble. But uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Dortmund actually did win the first game. I think it was a 2 0 and Mats Hummels scored in it. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, there was also a game where Dortmund had like the most shots of the season thus far. Um, so all in all, I think this is a very winnable game. I mean, Dortmund do play at home. I don't know if that uh, uh, adds something or, or removes something, but at least uh, having seen the Bielefeld pitch, I think it just helps Dortmund uh, to have a smooth surface. Um, 
what do you expect going into this game? I'll quickly add that uh, personal wise there is good news because uh, Torgen Hazard and then Axel Zagadou have returned to team training. I think Roman Bürki as well. So yes. Matthias, uh, that just adds the goodness. I don't know what happened to Delaney's foot. I think he got a knock. He missed training today. So he might be out for this game. I mean, we're recording this on Tuesday a bit earlier because we, we knew this was more about talking about the derby than the preview. So why wait another two days? I needed to talk about this. So Matthias, uh, with no further ado, uh, how are going to how are Dortmund going to carry this emotionally supercharged week into the next games, uh, which are, I think Bielefeld and then Bayern, right? Yeah, I mean it's it's the right kind of match in between um, Schalke and, and Bayern. Uh, the last uh, live football match in Germany I got to see was actually at the Bielefelder Alm uh, or Schuko Arena, I think it's <laughs> called now, um, with my son and my nephew and my sister, and that was really really cool. Uh, it was a zweite Bundesliga match where they destroyed Bochum uh, when uh, when Dutt was still the manager at Bochum. Hmm. Um, so obviously as a Münsteraner, I don't root for Bielefeld. I, I distinctly dislike them. So uh, it, it'll be nice for Dortmund to win this one. Now with Zagadou coming back, that's actually good because obviously Akanji is going to be out. Mm -hmm. But if Zagadou is back and he can slot into the back line, well, you have one of two options. Uh, you either put in Bellingham next to Dahoud or you put Chan next to Dahoud. Or if Meunier is still questionable, I'd put Chan at right back. I just don't want Moray there. I'm sorry. I know it's like I've moved on from Dahoud and now I found Moray. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. But... <laughs> I'm I'm going counter that a little bit. I I think that Moray is a better option at right back than Chan. I know defensively uh, uh, Moray isn't great, but I still well, think I he's mean, a better option right I now guess... than Chan. But I guess I, against I'm, Bielefeld you could do it. It's okay to disagree about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ideally, Thomas Meunier is back. Who who would have thought that? Yeah, but, exactly. Um, but he is the better right. He's the best right back Dortmund have. That's uh, without a question. Uh, he can cross the ball. He won't be physically pushed off. And his positioning is better than Moray's. And he's less erratic than um, than a ball-winning, box-to-box midfielder type that Chan is. I think Chan is best in central midfield. I personally would love to see a three-man midfield, personally. I, I think a four three three is what Dalton should play. Yeah, um, and you have Chan, Delaney, or Bellingham, depending on fitness, and Dahoud. That's those are the three I want in the midfield. You put Guerrero, Zagadou, Hummels, and Munier, and then up top, I would do Sancho, Royce, Holland. That's that's who I would start with, and then you bring in Hazard or Brandt or Reyna off the bench. Uh, Renier, I've been completely underwhelmed by. Uh, there was a situation in the Schalke match where he should have passed, and he he shot in a weird angle, carrying to goal. Where I'm like, pass the ball, pass the ball. San I think it was Sancho was like right there, or I don't remember who it was, but he was right there for a perfect shot, and he just went forward. and And maybe he just needs this season to acclimatize to the Bundesliga. Obviously, it's a two season loan, but uh, that that's the lineup I would like to see in a four three three. If you're gonna do a four two three one. Then if Delaney is questionable, you I'd want to see Dahoot next to Bellingham. And then in the 10 slot behind the striker, I mean, you may as well put Brandt in there. I wouldn't start Hazard just yet. No. Um, you know, you bring him off the bench. Uh, I, I And I would bring him off the bench before I'd bring on Reyna because Gio Reyna is just, he's completely off form. And and that may also just be due, due to his young age, but that's that's how I would like to see Dortmund play. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Uh, I I'm really intrigued how this is going to go. Obviously, Bielefeld uh, recently had that three-all draw against Bayern Munich, but that obviously was also on a snow-covered field, and Bayern just coming back from their Club World Cup, I think. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a very interesting game. Arminia mean, Bielefeld, obviously. Uh, can score on set pieces, but uh, honestly, uh, what Bielefeld can and cannot do in theory should not be uh, too much of a concern for this Dortmund team. I think if they just uh, continue where they have left off, and I know once bitten, twice shy, because we've seen this so many times that Dortmund have uh, performed on a high level and then completely deflated in the next game. 
Um, but yeah, I'm just hoping for once that Dortmund can pick up where they left off and uh, see it through because they need to run the table. As I mentioned before, Frankfurt and Wolfsburg right now are six points ahead of Dortmund and uh, neither team really looks like they're going to drop points really anytime soon. Frankfurt just uh, deservedly beat uh, Bayern Munich and I think Wolfsburg have not conceded in eight games. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the last time they conceded was Dortmund. No, Leipzig. Right? Leipzig. Leipzig? Okay. Yeah, they had a one all draw against Leipzig, I think, That's after true. Dortmund. That's also. true. I do believe Dortmund will uh, get past Leverkusen. I think Leverkusen is just right. on a downward trend that I don't see them getting out of. And Dortmund is in an upward trend. I don't foresee... I think Gladbach is in their own head now. And I think Union Berlin is kind of at their ceiling. Um, so, and I don't... And Freiburg, Stuttgart, Hoffenheim, I don't see them pushing up from where they are. So Europa League... I mean, like you said, I believe in not the last one, but the last uh, episode I was on, a season not being in the Champions League, if it's Europa League, financially, obviously, it stings in the COVID year, but Dortmund could survive it. Um, it it's not the end of the world. But ideally, Wolfsburg drop enough points that Dortmund get into the Champions League, because I really want Frankfurt to make the Champions League way over Wolfsburg. I just... You know, I have this dream that Wolfsburg, Leipzig, and Bayern are going to totally collapse and Frankfurt climb the table and become <laughs> champions. Because I just don't think Dortmund can do it anymore at this point. But it would be great if Frankfurt could do it. Yeah. Um, so in, in the perfect constellation, you know, Leipzig just completely fall apart <laughs> and drop out of the top four. That's not going to happen. Do I think Dortmund could catch a team in the top four? Yes, but a lot of things need to go their way. I think Europa League at this point is the most likely outcome. Yeah, I'm not fully sold on Dortmund now running the table, to be honest, because, uh, you know, we've we've seen it and uh, Dortmund will obviously struggle and obviously uh, they have the cup match against Gladbach between Bielefeld and Bayern. I think that's next Tuesday, so today in a week. And, uh, of course, they still play in a Champions League and Wolfsburg and Frankfurt don't have that, for example. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting, uh, to say the least, how, how this is going to all play out. But at least we have a little bit of tension right now at the top of the table because Leipzig are actually uh, within one game. Uh, I think they're just two points off Bayern right now, right? So um, I think yes. Jordan Clary yeah. actually asked us on Twitter uh, wh who we prefer to win, whether it be Bayern again or uh, Leipzig. Bayern. And Bayern. Yeah, I, I would rather Bayern win it 100 years in a row than Leipzig win it once. Yeah, that's exactly my that's, answer too. But the thing with Dortmund, I just pulled up the schedule. Dortmund play every team ahead of them still. Every single one of them will have to play. And Dortmund travel to Bayern. They will host Frankfurt. They travel to Wolfsburg. They host Leipzig. They host Leverkusen. So it's still there. It is still there. Dortmund can take enough points off the teams ahead of them in their own hands to make a difference. The key are those matches against Hertha, Köln, Stuttgart. Or Bielefeld. Bremen. <laughs> uh, yeah, Bielefeld. But really like Bremen, Union Berlin, Stuttgart. Those are the ones I look at where I'm like, Ugh. Nyeh. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um and that's kind of in between the Frankfurt Wolfsburg matches in April. Obviously, I'm looking way ahead now, but Dortmund still play every team ahead of them. So there is still hope to make the Champions League, not to win a title, but or not to win the Bundesliga title. Yeah, now that um, we have but, discovered the 4 3 3 yeah. and Mahmoud Dawood. Exactly. <laughs> the sky's the limit, man. Treble winner 2021. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matthias, I think that's a, a good point to end it. Uh, what's your prediction for the Bielefeld game? I think um, it's going to take a little bit of doing, but I think Dortmund are going to win this one 3 1. I'm uh, not as optimistic as you. I think Dortmund are going to win this 2 to 1, but uh, still going to sort of scrape out a win at the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who knows, really? This is this is always the trouble with predicting Dortmund games because you never know which exact team shows up. They could blow out Bielefeld 8 nothing for all I know. Or they could lose on like two weird set-piece goals and one from distance and a goalkeeping error and uh, no one really knows how and why. Um, but yeah, 
football is a low scoring game and uh, chances are unevenly distributed and even more unevenly scored, uh, which makes this all so much fun or dreadful depending on uh, the particular game day. Anyway, Matthias, thank you so much for coming on and celebrating Schalke's relegation with me, which uh, is obviously official on match day 22 <laughs> so uh yeah please tell our listeners where to follow you on twitter uh you can find me on twitter at matthias Uck. very well and you can find me at stefan Butzko on twitter you can follow all of us at yellow Wallpot on twitter and facebook and of course if you want to subscribe to the show or leave a nice comment please do that on youtube or itunes stitcher soundcloud spotify or Wubble. <laughs> I don't even know how it's pronounced, but I just got the email. I was like, yeah, why not? Let's sign up. So, um, yeah, they are all pre pretty much every uh, uh, podcatcher. Just type in Yellow Wall Pod and you'll find it. And of course, uh, for written content, the yellowwall.net is where you find all the writings. And we shall be back uh, after the. Uh, Bielefeld game, I think, must be Monday then. Maybe even Sunday. I mean, we got to preview that uh, very dicey game against Gladbach. But uh, until then, as always, thank you for listening and good. <laughs>